Good evening, everyone. I'm Derek Curtis. I'm a librarian for the Oliver Wendell Holmes Library and one of the organizers of the speaker series. And I want to welcome everyone to tonight's talk. This is the second talk in our five part series on the 2020 presidential election. Last week, we had the real privilege of hearing from Rihanna Gunn Wright, the, uh, one of the architects of the Green New Deal and the director of climate policy for the Roosevelt Institute. She talked about, she gave a really insightful talk about racism, the COVID-19 virus, and the climate crisis and their overlapping kind of issues and how a Green New Deal is necessary to adequately respond to those issues. Tonight, we are honored to have Michael Beschloss here with us to talk about presidential elections during times of national crisis, including our current presidential election and the future of American democracy. Before I hand over the microphone to two of our wonderful seniors, Amy Jang and Jason Wong, to give a more full introduction to Mr. Beschloss, I want to remind everyone that if you have a question for Mr. Beschloss, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom to submit that question. And after his remarks, Jason and Amy will read off some of those questions to him. And if you look in the chat feature right now, you will see a link to the web school's website for the uh, election series. And that includes the future speakers and the dates and times for their talks. And with that out of the way, I will hand it off to Jason and Amy to give the introduction for Mr. Beschloss. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. So Michael Beschloss, class of 1973, is one of the foremost American historians specializing in the United States presidency. Mr. Beschloss's books provide gripping tales and brilliant inside analysis, revealing the leadership secrets of great presidents and other towering figures in history. He is a contributing columnist for the New York Times, writing a monthly column on business history and a weekly column for sports history. Winner of an Emmy Award, Mr. Beschloss also serves as NBC News presidential historian and contributes to the PBS NewsHour. Mr. Breschloss is the author of nine best-selling books, including Presidents of War, The Epic Story from 1807 to Modern Times, Presidents Show Courage, Brave Leaders, and How They Changed America, 1789 to 1989, and two volumes on President Lyndon Johnson's Secret White House Taste. Mr. Breschloss is currently working on a book on the history of presidents and race relations. A graduate of Williams College and Harvard Business School, Mr. Beschloss has had appointments in history at the Smithsonian Institution, at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and at Harvard University at the Russian Research Center. In 2018, he was also awarded the Phillips Academy Alumni Award of Distinction. We're so excited to hear his talk tonight about the 2020 presidential election and the faith of democracy. Mr. Beschloss, thank you so much for being here tonight. The Zoom is yours. Oh, thank you. I, I hope I'm allowed to be promoted to Michael, if that's okay. Uh, limping in as I am from the, the class of 1973 prehistoric times. Uh, thank you to Derek for doing this. Uh, thank you to Jason and Amy. Jason, they're being very modest and self-effacing. Jason is in Shanghai tonight, although it's not night for him. It's 7 o'clock a.m. or so, 7.06. 7 and Amy is in Andover, Massachusetts, and I'm here in Washington, D.C., which the next couple of weeks may be the most dangerous place to be of all. Anyway, thank you to everyone who's watching tonight. I was trying to remember uh, when I was back at PA in the early 1970s, I'm so impressed that Jason and Amy are willing to do this. Uh, I have to honestly say that during my three years at PA, the number of Friday nights that I voluntarily listened to a lecture rather than doing other things was probably not very large. So thank you to everyone and also to Hiju Sun and everyone else, uh, Mike Krauss, who's been involved in doing this tonight and giving up at least part of your Friday night. Uh, it's totally appropriate for anyone, and especially an Andover alum, to talk about the history of the presidency because the person who did more to invent the presidency than any other was the namesake of our hall, George Washington, the first president, who not only came to PA, I hope I'm getting this right, my memory is 1789, but had a number of relatives who went to PA and actually liked very much what he saw when he came. 
But one reason why the Constitution is a little bit sketchy about what presidents can do and what they cannot do is that the founders of our country always assumed that whoever filled the role of president of the United States would have the character and the experience and the love for democracy that George Washington had. I'm afraid that has not always been the case throughout American history. Uh, what our friends have asked me to talk a little bit about tonight, and I'll talk for maybe 20 or 25 minutes, and then I hope there'll be some questions from those who are watching and listening, and also from uh, Jason and Amy, is does anything about the election campaign of 2020 remind me of anything in history? And much of what I know about this subject goes right back to the Andover History Department. So I was telling Hiju earlier, if I get any of this wrong, I hope that she'll be quiet enough not to correct me. Uh, my teachers, Scotty Royce and Wayne Frederick and Tom Lyons and also Ted Sizer, who was head of school and didn't technically teach history, but taught a great course called Family, Schools and Police. I though owe them an awful lot for what I have learned about democracy. Anything I get right tonight is owed to them. Anything I get wrong, they had nothing to do with. So uh, let's start with that question. Does anything about 2020 and the campaign and the election remind me of anything in American history? And it really reminds me of two presidential elections that have gone before more than anything else. One was 1860. Uh, one was 80 years after that, which was 1940. And then interestingly enough, there's sort of a historical symmetry. Here we are 80 years after the 1940 election, the year 2020, in which we are once again trying to elect a new president of the United States. What makes those three elections alike? Uh, from my point of view, in every single one of the three, these are cases in which we Americans ran a real risk of losing our democracy, losing our democratic system. That was true in 1860, it was true in 1940, and to my mind, although I'm not in politics, I think it is very true now in the year 2020. Going back to 1860, as everyone who's been through uh, the survey course in history that has been taught in Andover for an awfully long time, mainly upper year, you know about the election of 1860. That was a time when, as Abraham Lincoln had said, one of the candidates, this was a nation that could not stand for long, half slave or half free. And virtually everyone who voted in that election that year knew that there was a chance, depending on who won and what happened after that, that we might not live in a democratic system that was based on a union of all the states that the found, founders had thought of decades before. So Lincoln was elected. Soon after that, we had a civil war. And for four and a half years, there was a fight over whether this would be a union. And the interesting thing about Lincoln is he loved democracy so much that he began as a president who was fighting merely to bring North and South back together but he knew so much to, about democracy and he loved democracy, loved the union so much and also came to feel so strongly about liberating African Americans that by the time the Civil War was over, this was no longer just a war to bring North and South together legalistically, but it was a war to liberate African Americans and to make this a better country. And that's why it was so important that Lincoln had the knowledge of history he had. He was mainly self-taught, didn't have the honor of going to Andover. He had about only about a year and a half of what any of us could really call formal education, part of this in a blab school in central Illinois and Kentucky and Indiana, where you know people of all ages were yelling in the same room. He was an enormous reader. He loved democracy. If he did not love democracy so much, we might not be living in a democratic system today. Uh, there was one flaw in Lincoln's judgment, and that is uh, he sent his oldest son, Robert Lincoln, to boarding school, and he did not have the wisdom to send him to Andover. He sent him to a school 
that goes under the Phillips name up in, in New Hampshire. I think it's E-X-E-T-E-R. I don't want to say the name, but that's where Robert Lincoln went to school. Uh, otherwise, I would really look at Abraham Lincoln as a wonderful example of a president who preserved our democracy and was desperate to do so. Another example of that, as I mentioned earlier, was 1940, when Franklin Roosevelt was running for a third term against Wendell Wilkie, who was the nominee of the Republicans. Wilkie, although we now know he really was someone who had a great reverence for democracy and probably would have been fine as president, although he had no political experience, he was a, uh, someone whose experience had been in business and actually had been a Democrat until about a year or two before 1940. Wilkie ran in that campaign as someone who was saying, elect me, don't vote for Franklin Roosevelt because if you vote for Roosevelt, you're gonna be in danger of our country being at war within a few months of Roosevelt's inauguration for a third term. And there were senators who said it was as vulgar as this. They said, elect Roosevelt and we'll be at war a few months after inauguration day. And you can expect that he will, and this term was actually used, plow under every fourth American boy. And people loved their families and they were worried about American sons, and it was sons in those days, more or less, being sent off to die in a war against Imperial Japanese or Nazi Germans or fascist Italians. And it might turn out to be as fruitless as World War I had been. So Wilkie got a lot of mileage out of this isolationist effort. And by this point in the campaign, and this point I mean, uh, here we are, what are we, the 16th of October, mid-October, Roosevelt and Wilkie were running about even. And so if Roosevelt had been less of a leader, he would have pledged to stay out of war, said, elect me to a third term, I'll make sure we go, don't go to war. He didn't do that. He didn't do that for reason of principle and also because he wanted to be in a position that if he were reelected, he could say, I've got a mandate to go to war with Germany and Japan if necessary if there's an attack on us. And so the result was he said to Americans, you know, I will do everything I can to keep out of war, but in case we're attacked, I can't promise you that we will not fight back. And in the meantime, I'm gonna do two things. Number one, we're gonna to try to build 50,000 planes and prepare our defense and to do this as a way of staying out of war. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start the draft, involuntary draft of young American males into the military in case we have to go to war. And that was immensely courageous of Roosevelt to do because, you know, especially mothers and fathers too, saw Roosevelt who actually appeared personally at the draft ceremony. There was a lottery in Washington. Roosevelt, you know, like a brave leader, stood there while these numbers were being chosen. And in the audience, there were li literally mothers and some fathers who shrieked when they heard numbers being called that might meant, mean that their children would, would go off to war. That's how courageous Roosevelt was. And because he loved democracy and because he wanted to defend it, even at the cost of his reelection for a third term, we Americans were prepared so that at the time of Pearl Harbor, 13 months after he was reelected, we had enough military preparation that we could help the allies move to victory and win victory in Europe and in Asia in 1945. If Roosevelt had loved democracy less, that would not have happened. So those are the two historical examples of years in which I think democracy was at stake, civil war, and also it was at stake in 1940 had we not been prepared to help our allies defend the free world against the Imperial Japanese and the Italians and the Germans and their, and their allies among the Axis powers. So let's, let's take this up to 2020. Uh, as I said, I'm not in politics. I'm not going to lecture anyone about taxes or healthcare. That's, that's not what I do in life. 
But what I do do in life is look at current events and say, does this remind us of anything? And I've seen what's gone on, particularly this year, but also the last three and a half years. And I think it should give us a lot of warning signals that we are in danger of losing our democracy if the election goes in a certain direction this year. Here we are this fall, we're dealing with crises of a kind that are, you know, loom very large in American history, no matter what happens. A pandemic that has claimed over 200,000 Americans, which means two thirds the American combat deaths in World War II, which were about 300,000 people. An economic crisis that is causing a lot of Americans to suffer. And I regret to think a lot more may suffer before it's over. And number three, that we've seen the newest example of this past summer, the fact that we've got issues of racial justice that we have shamefully not confronted for 400 years. And in certain ways, they're as ripe as they have ever been before. And a president who has looked at this mainly in terms of suppressing dissent and trying to have law and order rather than looking at issues in American society in the spirit of Robert Kennedy, who used to say, Kennedy used to say, it is not enough to allow dissent, we must demand it. Kennedy understood and loved democracy enough that he knew that the person who protests is as great a patriot or more so as someone who is president of the United States because the only way we become a, a better country is through self-criticism. So why am I saying that we are in danger of losing our democracy next year? Uh, a few things. Uh, number one, I think the record of the last three and a half years has been our incumbent president has shown, to put it mildly, little of the reverence for democracy that students at PA saw with George Washington in 1789. Someone who knew that democracy was fragile, that the presidency, its ability to preserve democracy depended on someone uh, who was not looking just at the constitution, but looking at democratic traditions and institutions and knowing that even if those things were not in the constitution, the job of the president was to help preserve this fragile flower of democracy or what Jefferson called the contagion of a democracy around the world. And that the other thing was that George Washington believed in limited presidential power. After two terms, he gave up the presidency, he went back to Mount Vernon. He didn't expect to be a king, even though he was so popular that if he had wanted to become a king, for the rest of his life, he could have done that. He never joked, joked, as we've heard President Trump joke, or maybe it was not such a joke that, you know, he might deserve a third term or a fourth term or want to stay on. That was something that George Washington would not have found very funny. And I think whenever we are looking at a president in terms of democracy, you have to take the things he does and says seriously, because as the founders said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And when you're looking at a president thinking, is this someone who deserves a second term? You have to ask the question, is this someone who shows the kind of respect for preserving democracy that George Washington would have liked to see or Abraham Lincoln would li have liked to see? I would say tonight, there is substantial reason for worry. Uh, president Trump, especially this year has shown that he doesn't have a great reverence for checks and balances between the presidency and other branches. Uh, he has re resisted subpoenas. He's done almost everything he can to dominate Congress. He has tried to do everything he possibly can, I believe, to make sure that the Supreme Court would not be a challenge to him. And if you look at it this way, President Trump has had three vacancies. Uh, one at the very, begin very beginning, uh, that was taken by Justice Gorsuch, a second one that was taken by Justice Kavanaugh, another that is in the process of going very likely to what would be Justice Barrett. And one argument I would make is that 
in a way, all three of those vacancies have been artificially created. The first one was created because Senate Republicans refused to allow Barack Obama for his last year in office to appoint a Supreme Court justice. That's something that has been not, never denied in that way to any other president. We're now in a situation where we now see with Judge Barrett, a Senate confirmation that will come closer to a president's reelection or effort for reelection than any other confirmation in American history, something that's ahistorical. Uh, so basically two vacancies that a more restrained president might not have had. And then the middle vacancy I mentioned, uh, we know that President Trump and the people around him went to the family uh, of Anthony Kennedy, who was on the Supreme Court, made a big effort to encourage him to leave so that President Trump could appoint someone new. Usually in American history, presidents have had a more restrained attitude and have not been so zealous to open up places on the court that might be people who the president concerned thought would be more likely to rule in favor of things that he likes. Uh, Thomas Jefferson once said he'd rather have a press without a government than a government without a press because Jefferson knew that one of the safeguards of our liberty is having a free press that points out what presidents do wrong and especially when they get too much in the direction of being too tyrannical. He hated much of what the press said about him. Every president does. But until now, every president has understood that although uh, the press is not a branch of government, it is mentioned in the Constitution and protected and a crucial part of preserving democracy. We have never had in American history a president say, as President Trump has said, that the press is the enemy of the people. That's a quote that does not come from American history. It comes from Soviet history. It was something that Stalin said uh, and something that I don't think any president who loves democracy would say, something that is a cause for alarm. Uh, State Department, we've seen a politicization of the State Department of a kind that we certainly haven't seen in the last 80 years. We saw the spectacle at this summer's Republican convention of a Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, speaking at a political convention. That usually is not on because we have thought that Secretaries of State should stay out of politics. Defense Department, one of the safeguards of liberty has been that the Defense Department, our military is not used by a president for domestic political purposes. And we saw an exception to that this summer. Anyone who was watching in June, the abuse of our military in Lafayette Square to restore order so that President Trump could have a photo op in front of a church near Lafayette Square. Uh, that's something that doesn't happen in American history. And it was so bad that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, felt the need, thank God, to go on TV and literally apologize to the American people for allowing the president to push him to use the military in ways that should not be used. One of the ways that we preserve our liberty is to make sure that no president can abuse our military in a way that may challenge or disrupt the functioning of, of government and free elections. Justice Department, another safeguard of liberty is to have an independent Justice Department Increasingly, we are not seeing that. And we're seeing a Justice Department that increasingly has been acting almost, almost as a private law firm for a president. You saw the president calling on Attorney General Barr to use the Justice Department to go after Hillary Clinton and to go after Barack Obama and to go after his opponent, Joe Biden, for reasons that I don't think are statesmanlike. And one of the happy developments may be, this is going to wait on history, that perhaps this fall, that is one case in which Attorney General Barr has stood up to the president. We also see signs of political abuse of the FBI. And I have never been prouder, at least from what I've seen, of the director of the FBI, whose name is Chris Ray. Guess where he went to high school? 
went to high school uh, at Phillips Academy. He is now under threat from a president who kept on, keeps on saying he doesn't like the fact that Ray is being so independent. One thing that makes me happy is I think that Chris Ray learned democracy in the same place that we all did, which was the Phillips Academy History Department. Above and beyond that, the last few years, we've seen personal corruption, an effort to merchandise and squeeze money out of the presidency in this president that George Washington would be turning over in his grave. Uh, a desire to ally with dictatorships uh, in various countries in the world that would have appalled Thomas Jefferson if he came back to life. One of the presidents of the United States that also learned democracy at Andover was George H.W. Bush, who was a member of the class of 1942, whom I had the honor of knowing very well, and his sons Marvin and, and Jeb were at PA when I was there as well. And George Bush gave an inaugural address in 1989. A few of you might remember seeing it. And in that address, he said, this was January of 1989, the day of the dictator is over. And what Bush was referring to was the fact that dictatorship in the Soviet Union was ebbing, dict dictatorship in other countries was beginning to wind down. We were living in a new day, as Bush saw it, in which we could see what Jefferson called that contagion of freedom going around the world. That was a much happier time than now. In those days, President George Bush was on the side of freedom around the world. I'm not so sure that President Trump is tonight. And another president talked about this in the debates of 1960. John Kennedy was debating with Richard Nixon, just as President Trump, I think, will be debating with Joe Biden next week. And John Kennedy, whose son John was at Andover in the class of 1978, died tragically, John Jr. did. I knew him a little bit later on. He was five years younger than I was. But John Kennedy, the father of the president, said in his debates with Richard Nixon, if we succeed, we Americans, the cause of freedom will succeed around the world. But, he said, if we fail, the entire cause of freedom fails. So I would say tonight, and I'm speaking myself, not quoting Kennedy anymore, if we fail to preserve our democracy, not only will we lose it in this country, in our system, but it may be extinguished around the world, especially if you have a president who doesn't feel very strongly about trying to strengthen democracy around the world. Another thing that I think is very important is a president who encourages democratic traditions. Sometimes those things are called democratic norms, which I think is too technical a term, and what I mean by that is traditions that began with George Washington. George Washington didn't, didn't want to live like a rich person, although he was one of the richest presidents we ever had. When he was inaugurated, he did in probably a burlap suit, we think. Uh, Thomas Jefferson took it to an even greater extreme. He didn't want the inaugurations to be monarchical. He rode to his inauguration on a horse. And he actually banned the process of an annual message in person to Congress, which we now call the State of the Union, because Jefferson thought that that was too monarchical. Jefferson felt that every president was honor bound to show that he was not eager to take too much power. I think if Jefferson were alive and if he had seen the last three years of a president who I think has a lot of contempt for democracy, does not know our history, and eager to take on as much power as possible, even if it becomes authoritarian, I think Jefferson would cry. So I don't want to make this part of it too long because I want to save some time for questions from those who are watching and listening and also especially from Amy and Jason, but just say a few more things that hope it's okay if I take maybe five more minutes to, to uh, say, and I think I'll be staying in time. What should we be alert for right now, we Americans, if we are worried about this campaign and this election being a threat to democracy? We have seen the spectacle of a president who has refused to guarantee a peaceful transition of power. 
George Washington would be heartbroken. He is the one who gave up the presidency after two terms, and that caused members of the British monarchy and others to say, that shows that George Washington is a great man. He could have been president forever, yet he has voluntarily given up power. That shows that the American system of democracy has a chance of surviving. Instead, we've got a president right now, we Americans in 2020, who won't even give lip service to the idea that if he loses the ele election, he should leave. He has challenged the idea of mail-in ballots in the middle of the pandemic when people need these to vote without getting sick. You know, there are a lot of seniors and others who were immunocompromised. They cannot go to a polling place. Are they expected to give up their ballot because Donald Trump does not like to see mail-in ballots used? He has tried to destroy the post office, which has a proud history that goes back to 1793 and Ben Franklin, uh, to make sure that this is a system that may not deliver mail-in ballots on time. That, is now, that effort is now being defeated in the courts. It may be too late. Most of us have seen the scenes of sorting machines being broken up and taken away so that the post office cannot be uh, cannot perform in the way that they should. And another thing we've seen is a president, you know, in public, you know, essentially calling on authoritarian, maybe even fascist groups like the so-called Proud Boys and QAnon to get involved in keeping voters from voting. When have we ever seen this before in American history? One reason it is crucial for all of us to know history as it's taught in the Andover History Department is so that we know when it's going off the rails. And from my point of view, and those of you, you know, whom I know and who, who know me, this is not the way I normally talk. We are in real danger of going off the rails and having our democracy taken away if we do not fight for it. And all I would say to everyone within the sound of my voice Please sleep with one eye open the next 18 days. Those of you who are old enough, please make sure you vote. Those who are not that old, please make sure that you're involved because you've got a president who has said, even if I'm defeated, I, the incumbent president, I might not concede power. And there will be a crucial 10 weeks after the election in which you may see a president refusing to leave the White House abusing presidential power in all sorts of ways that we had not seen before, that requires all of us who are citizens to use the role of citizen in as energetic a way as we possibly can. Harry Truman used to say, the most powerful job in America is not president, it's the role of citizen because we're the president's boss. Never forget that if we see our president try to act like an authoritarian. And to go back to John Kennedy, a father of an Andover alum whom I mentioned earlier, Kennedy said in his inaugural, in a different context, January 1961, he said, and I won't do my bad Kennedy imitation, he said, in the long history of the world, only a few generations of Americans have granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. To my mind, and I don't think I'm overstating a bit, we tonight, just as he thought it was from the Soviet Union in 1961, I think we may be in our democracy, may be in a moment of maximum danger. And everyone who's listening to the sound of my voice is going to have to rescue this country if that happens and rescue this democracy. If I might say to the students and younger people who are listening, uh, my generation, as I say, I'm class, Andover class of 1973. This is Jurassic Park times. This is a long time ago. My generation has failed you. We have made some very bad decisions, which has led to the fact that we are now in jeopardy tonight, as I've said, of losing our democracy. All I can say is we are depending on you younger people to save this country and save our de democratic system. 
And if I can close with a happier note, if you're an historian or if you're a student of American history, as everyone who's been through the Andover History Department is, and I think most of us, even if we're not professional historians, because of the, that great teaching, we love history for the rest of our life. If you're an historian, you have to mainly be an, an optimist and look at more than two centuries of American history. We've been through wars, we've been through pandemics, 1918, 1919, which killed 775,000 Americans with a president, Woodrow Wilson, who could have cared less, never gave one speech to Americans. This is how you can protect ourselves. We've had presidents before who have failed us. We've had economic crises, medical crises, all sorts of crises. But always in the end, our system prevails. So all I'm saying is do not bet against our system, even if we have a supreme crisis of democracy during the next 18, year, uh, 18 days or the 10 weeks after that. But if that happens, we've got a great constitution, we've got a, a wonderful system, but it really depends on everyone making sure that they act energetically as citizens. And I know that anyone who's been through Phillips Academy will do that. I'll close with that and say, we're all depending on you. Amy and Jason. There Thank you, Richard Rosslash. So, so you for, please, Michael, I hope. Uh, As I said, you, my Michael. father is not in on this call, so I'm going to keep on looking around. <laughs> um, so for our first question, we wanted to ask how there's a great deal of talk about how the country is deeply divided culturally, politically, and economically. How divided do you think we are compared to past moments of great division? How do you see these divisive dynamics playing out? And what can be done at the presidential level to help repair these divisions or even just like as us as students, what can we do? Uh, wonderful question, Amy. I will not presume to wonder where you, you, you uh, were taught so well to ask a question that's so on point, but it really is. And this is a divided country. The founders understood that. They knew that this would be a country that as time went on would become more and more divided the larger it did would be divided in ideology and geography and all different kinds of people, yet they assumed that the country would stick together. And they put a lot of burden on two things. Number one, that Americans would know their history. You remember uh, in Lincoln's first inaugural address, he says, he refers to the mystic chords of memory that stretch back to every patriot's grave. And what he meant by that was that Americans in 1861, you know, the Revolutionary War was recent enough that Americans knew what we had been through. They knew what price everyone had paid, almost every family to win our independence. And so that at the end of the day, both Lincoln and our founders felt there should be debate and fights all day long over policy. You know, the founders said, you know, this is my words, not theirs. We don't want to be like the British system. We want big debates. We want people to fight over policy in Congress because that's the way you have the best policy. But at the end of the day, we're all Americans. We all have a tankard of ale together. That would have been the first thing that George Washington would have said, and he probably said it at some point, during his visit to Andover in 1789, Washington was someone who even hated the idea that there were political parties that were that divi divided. So there was an assumption that even in the year 2020, Americans would know their history enough that we would love the country enough so that our divisions would have a limit. We don't know our history that well anymore. Uh, in 1940, on the 29th of December, Franklin Roosevelt went on radio after he won the election to talk about the crisis that was being posed by the Imperial Japanese and the Germans. And Roosevelt said, never before since Jamestown and Plymouth Rock have we been in so much danger as we are tonight. Uh, he was right about that, but in 1940, he could talk about Jamestown and, and Plymouth Rock and assume that Every American would know what those things meant. 
Sadly, in 2020, we don't. And so that's one problem we've got in terms of this country being unified. The larger problem is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, our wonderful constitution puts too much of a burden on the person who happens to be elected president. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, everyone just assumed that anyone who won the presidency would have enough love for democracy and enough small d democratic temperament that the president would want to, to unify this country. And if you look at inaugural addresses from, a, uh, from George Washington all the way on, uh, in one respect or another, those are all, respect or another, those are all unifying addresses because you have a president coming from, through a raucous campaign, has a national audience, as president of all the people, his, and one day I hope it's gonna be her, but his opportunity is there to unify the country and become president of all the people. The first inaugural address I ever heard that did not do that was Donald Trump's uh, in 2017, which I watched and listened to with an open mind. It was called American Carnage and it sought to pit group against group. And that was a warning sign that this would be a president who was unlike any other. So all I'm saying is, you know, eternal vigil vigilance. The founders always wanted us to watch our leaders to make sure that they did not take too much power. They also wanted us to demand of our leaders and especially our presidents that they fulfill the, the, the role that George Washington imagined for them of unifying the country, that's something we haven't had. So, you know, your question, sorry for the long answer, we are as divided as ever, but what we have lacked for three and a half years is a president saying, let's remember all the things that bring us together and let's try to think of national interests that are above ourselves. And what better way of saying that than the two words, non city the last three and a half years, we haven't heard much non civi from our national leadership, tragically. I hope we hear it soon. See. Thank you, Mr. Meshos. Oh, thanks, Jason. My, Michael, do you mind? Is that okay? Yes, I definitely know. Just to be polite, but- No, um, we, be, please be I, impolite, which is not impolite, but thank yeah. you. Uh, you mentioned a lot of great politicians throughout the history of the United States, say Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Roosevelt. So what constitutes the idea of a statesman? Would the figures of, say, Jefferson be considered a statesman? And how do we reconcile the profoundly unstatement-like aspects of Jeff Jefferson's life at Monticello compared to his actions in Washington, D.C.? Absolutely. The fact that Thomas Jefferson was by no means a perfect person, and that was also true of the other presidents you named. George Washington was a slave owner. Not only was he a slave owner, I love the fact that he loved democracy, but he didn't love democracy for everyone. And at Mount Vernon, he had slaves, which were mainly paid for by his rich wife. And when he went to New York and Philadelphia, he took some of those slaves with him and some of them tried to escape. And Washington you know, made a big effort to try to have them dragged back to his service. In his defense, he tried to have some of their slaves liberated when he died in 1799. But George Washington was by no means a perfect person. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said a lot of nice things about equality but that did not apply to the many slaves he had at Monticello. And anyone who has been to Monticello or who goes there to visit, which I hope you will in Virginia, they've done a very good job of restoring the slaves' quarters and shown, showing how the enslaved people did not have the promise of liberty that Thomas Jefferson felt for white men especially, but certainly did not feel for Sally Hemings with whom he slept and sired children and owned her under the laws of the time until he died. So you're absolutely right, Jason. These are presidents who were anything but perfect. And I would say the same thing about Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt. 
but the way that we get them to be more perfect is, remember I was talking a little bit earlier about American society where Robert Kennedy said, it's not enough to allow dissent, we must demand it. Frank, uh, Donald Trump wants to squash dissent. He's the one who said that the press is the enemy of the people. I believe if you had another term of Donald Trump as president, unless he wildly changes his instincts, you will see a big effort to shut down the press, to shut down newspapers, to close down publishing houses and news departments of TV networks. I never thought in my whole life I would ever say things like that, but there is at least the danger that that might happen. Consider that danger extremely carefully. So in terms of the presence that you mentioned, Jason, my threshold demand of any president, I hope for more, but my threshold demand is that you want the presidency, you better love democracy and show me how you're gonna preserve democracy. And with Donald Trump, and again, I'm not saying this politically, I'm not getting into his positions on issues. That's not my business to talk about as an historian. But if he has done things and said things that make me think that we are in danger and I've got a wife and two children who are 26 and 24, neither of them had the honor of going to Andover, but they love democracy too. I want them kept safe. I want them to live in a democracy. Every other election during their lifetimes, I've always felt that even though I may have liked some of the candidates and didn't like others, it was certain that my children would grow up in a democracy. I'm not so sure of that tonight. And I, all I'm saying is that those of us Americans who have to cast votes, please keep that in mind. Thank you, Michael. Hi, so, Amy. For glad, our glad you're back. <laughs> um, so for our next question, we wanted to ask you something about court packing. Mm -hmm. So some liberal political analysts have argued that if Biden wins the presidency and Democrats win back the Senate, that they should rebound SCOTUS by expanding it and placing more liberal justices in those new spots. What are your thoughts on this view? It's a, it's a problem I've got. Uh, I was, we were talking a little bit offline before we began, I and Amy and Jason and Hiju, that I was in the, maybe a few people are watching tonight who were in the Washington intern program, which alas is no more, but that was, you got to spend the spring term of your upper year working in a congressional office and living with Exeter students who were seniors, we were uppers. And as a result of that, you'd get credit for academics in your spring term and the result was we missed the spring term of upper year in the history survey course. So, you know, I used to say, well, I know everything that happened in American history until about 1920, but no one taught me anything after that. So everything I know about court packing, I know from my learning and reading later on. 1937, Franklin Roosevelt made an effort to pack the Supreme Court as it was called by those who did not like it those who liked the idea called it court expansion or court reform. And what happened was Roosevelt was frustrated by the fact that a very conservative Supreme Court kept on striking down pieces of New Deal legislation. There were three conservative justices who were giving him particular trouble. So rather than wait to appoint uh, new justices on resignation of a justice or death of one, Roosevelt said, you know, a president really should be allowed to add to the number of justices on the Supreme Court. So let's say if he got three slots, he would get to support uh, to appoint three progressive justices who would then make it very likely that Roosevelt's progressive legislation would make it through the court. There was a big fight against that. Roosevelt lost. Uh, the Democrats had the Senate in 1937, but they were very conservative and they were very Southern. They didn't like the idea of what they called court packing. So as a result of the current situation where in a couple of weeks, assuming that Amy Coney Barrett is going to be confirmed and join the court, we will have a situation where there's probably a six to three majority. And we may have a situation where God forbid this election is contested and it finally goes to the Supreme Court. Donald Trump has said he expects it to go to the Supreme Court. 
and it may go to the Supreme Court and guess who may be in the position of casting the deciding vote, Amy Coney Barrett, who was appointed a couple of weeks earlier by the president for whom she is voting if that happens. She was asked during her hearings, would she recuse herself because she's got an obvious conflict. Trump is appointing her in October. She's getting confirmed in late October. She joins the court. She's planning to rule on Obamacare one week after the election and may after that rule in a contested election. To my mind, it's disgusting. Uh, in 1974, William Rehnquist was on the Supreme Court. He had been nominated to the court by Richard Nixon. He had to rule that summer in a case called United States versus Nixon on whether Nixon would be compelled to release his secret tapes. And Rehnquist said, I worked in Richard Nixon's Justice Department. He put me on the court. I'm going to recuse myself because I've got a conflict. Instead, Judge Barrett has been given the opportunity to say that she might well recuse herself. She said, I don't know, which to me says, good chance I'm not going to recuse myself. Can everyone listening to me tonight imagine the bitterness and the heartsick reaction that people in this country will have even those who may support Donald Trump this fall, if this election is decided by Amy Coney Barrett, uh, the appointee of Donald Trump in a vacancy that he helped to create. Uh, I hope that faith and democracy will survive that. I'm not sure that it will. So you were asking about so-called court packing when something like this has happened in American history, it makes people very frustrated. And for a Democrat, and I should say, I'm a registered independent, I voted for a lot of Republicans, so I'm not carrying Democrats water tonight. For a Democrat who saw, saw a seat stolen away from Barack Obama, another seat that was, as I suggest, artificially created to encourage Anthony Kennedy to get off the court, and I hate to mention this, but Anthony Kennedy's son was Donald Trump's banker at Deutsche Bank. And that relationship was abused to encourage Anthony Kennedy to leave the court. And now we have a vacancy that I think in any other democratic system, a president like Lincoln, as he did in 1864, would say, there's a presidential election in a couple of weeks, let the new president make this appointment not a president who may be a lame duck in 18 days. We haven't had the courtesy of having that happen. So it causes a lot of people to be frustrated and say, maybe the democratic system isn't working. And if there's a new democratic president, if it's Joe Biden, maybe he should consider expanding the court and appointing three progressive justices, more or less. The constitution doesn't say how many people have to be on the Supreme Court. I guarantee you there will be an effort to get him to think of doing that if he's the new president-elect. Whether it's gonna happen, I can't predict. I have enough problems trying to, to understand the past rather than the future. Thank you, Michael. Uh, for the last kind of question tonight, we would like to know, so if you could tell the next president just to the previous president for the guidance on how to govern in this particular historical moment, what president would that be and why would you pick him? Well, there will be one of two possible people who might be president. One of them might be Donald Trump, as I've suggested tonight, and I'm not getting partisan in terms of issues. I'm speaking purely in terms of the danger tonight to democracy. There's been very little evidence that would suggest to me that we can sleep soundly for the next four years as people who love democracy in the next four years. And I, I think there have been a lot of alarm bells that would suggest that democracy is endangered in the next four years. We've seen how he's behaved in the last four years, even now in the fall when he's up for reelection. If Donald Trump suggests doubt about the peaceful transfer of power talks about you know, the Justice Department acting against newspapers, talks about infringing on an independent Justice Department, 
talks about abusing our military to get involved in politics and cause voter suppression and intimidate voters who may be going to the polls. This is when he's good, go, on good behavior trying to suggest that he might respect democracy. I shudder what might happen if Donald Trump were reelected without the constraint of having to run for another term and without much constraint from Republican senators who have shown very little inclination to place many limits on him during the last four years. That's the situation that we may be in in 18 days, purely as a small D Democrat. I hope that does not happen. If Joe Biden should be president, this is not a perfect person either, but if you're looking at Joe Biden in terms of someone who loves small D democracy, I think he's your man. He is a person of great modesty and restraint. He knows what we've missed for the last four years. And I think one of the first things that he will try to do is what Abraham Lincoln talked about. This is me and Lincoln talking, not Biden. Don't want to put words in his mouth. In Lincoln's second inaugural, talking about binding up the nation's wounds with malice toward none and charity for all, trying to make this one country again. One of the tragedies of American history was that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and could not make good on that promise. And the result was we had, as we were taught in the Andover History Department, we had eight years of reconstruction, and then we had Jim Crow and even worse racial and geographical division. We are suffering from that even tonight. We didn't have the benefit of Abraham Lincoln being there for four years to heal our country. I think if we had Joe Biden, uh, you might disagree with him on some issues, I might too, but in terms of a president who would unify the country and understand that after nearly four years of this division and this ill will, the first job of the next president is gonna to be to try to heal this nation as Gerald Ford did and as Jimmy Card Carter did after Richard Nixon as Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower did after the traumas of the Great Depression and a World War II and all the changes that were involved. And as I suggest, as Abraham Lincoln would have done had he been allowed to live after 1865. So here's a case where I hope, hope our next president, I think it's doubtful it's gonna happen if it's Donald Trump, but if it is J Joe Biden, this is someone who respects history and has read a lot of history. He knows who Lincoln was. He would never make a statement such as we heard last night on NBC from Donald Trump that he's done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. That's an abomination. Anyone who's studied Lyndon Johnson or a lot of other presidents would know that that is not true. Uh, Biden is someone who may sometimes make mistakes, may get it wrong on issues, may even get it wrong in terms of trying to restore democracy, but I have very little doubt that at least for anyone who's listening to us tonight who's worried that this democracy might be gone in a year, if Joe Biden's president, I think that his heart would be in the right place. And I can tell you, you know, I've been an alum of Andover ever since I graduated in 1973. I never thought I would live to see the day when I was talking to any kind of Andover audience that was even echoing the, the notion of endorsing a candidate, which I am not doing, but I'm just trying to share how worried I am dem about democracy tonight. And to say, thank you for everything I learned at PA and, uh, Thank you to Amy and Jason. If I can say one more word after you come back on. Can you both come back on with the audio and the video? There they are, there's Jason and Amy, there they are. I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving up your Friday night or your Friday morning and, or it's Saturday morning, right, Jason? It is. In Shanghai, thank you for giving up your time. Thank you for doing this. In the case of both of you, I feel much better about the future of the world, knowing that you're gonna be making these decisions, not people like me. And if I could say to everyone else who's listening on the call, I hope that you and your families are well. And I hope that a year from now, my worries about democracy are wrong and we are living in a happier country and a happier world. 
than all of us are tonight. Thank you for including me. Oh, well, thank you, Michael. That was an uh, excellent analysis that the community needed and a wonderful history lesson and a wonderful history lesson also about Andover. And I want to echo your thoughts on Jason and Amy. They uh, did expert moderation of the question and answer and a wonderful job introducing you. And lastly, I want to thank all the participants for showing up on a Friday evening and engaging in the Civic Act. Uh, before we leave, I want to say again that the series continues next week on Friday, where we'll be hearing from the historian Robert Green on African American voters and the realignment of the Democratic Party. And with that, it's a good evening. So thank everyone for showing up. Thanks again. Be well.